the Nifty Show. And once again, it is the Nifty Show, the world's best Nifty podcast, according to our mothers. I'm Joel Com, and that other fellow right there, that would be Sir Lord Travis Wright, ambassador of joy, deliverer of comedy. Thank you. Thank you. It is my great honor and pleasure to be here today. No one is more honored and pleased than I. I'm the best at pleasure. <laughs> so today we have a unique guest for you. And, you know, we asked Elon Musk if he would come on the show. And uh, I think he was too stoned to, uh, to reply, uh, too busy trying to take over Twitter which uh, I would say we both would support. And so in lieu of that, we located a, uh, an account that goes by the name Bored Elon Musk. It's the closest we could get to it. And turns out uh, the fella chooses to remain anonymous, but he's got 1.7 million followers on Twitter and his website is BoredElon.com. Mr. Uh, Not Elon, welcome to the Nifty Show. Thank you. My my mother also thinks you have the best uh, podcast out there. So that's three. That's three now. <laughs> three moms. Ooh, three moms agree. <laughs> that's, that's, that's so great. I, I want to ask this right off the jump: Is uh, why are you green instead of like wood? Because if you're bored, wouldn't you be green? <laughs> funny, funny. Uh, that's good. Good. Good dad joke there. Um, you. you know the the green thing was a recent migration for the first seven or so years of running this account. It was a, it was kind of like an illustration of Elon's face. And uh, as it's gotten bigger, I decided to slowly shift away a little bit. And so this is like vaguely resembling Elon, but not quite, uh, especially yeah. as I've kind of shared my voice and, and been on podcasts and stuff. And we know you're not Elon. You can make another account, though, called Stoned Elon. And all the interviews, like all your tweets would be like, <coughs> yeah, man, SpaceX, <laughs> Tesla, let's go, LFG. Twitter I got to ask real quick before we get too far in here. Bored yep. Elon, B O R E D E L O N, right? The 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 Twitter handle is Bored Elon Musk, but you got the spelling right, yeah. And okay, because, uh, because Bored Elon is uh, is uh, the account is suspended. Oh well, that that is definitely not me. Funny funny enough, right? Like I'm a parody of a real person, and there are parodies of of me who is a parody. Lots of uh, spammers and people pretending to be me, trying to get other people to to click on on nefarious links. Unfortunately, so so why anonymous? Are you like super ugly or something or what? First of all, yes. Second of all, I think it's just fun. I mean, it's kind of like um, you know Banksy, right? Like you probably don't care who he is. It's it's part of the brand. It's part of the mystery that 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 drives uh, interest. I think around him is who who is Banksy, um, and. I, I usually use the term pseudonymous because I've, I've been around for eight years. I've built up a reputation. Somebody who's anonymous can kind of just show up and disappear and do whatever they're going to do. I do have a reputation to lose that I've built up. Um, so, so the pseudonym kind of works, works for me, but it was really just, um, you know, done as, as an accident. When I started the account, um, I wanted it to feel like this was a parody of, of a real person of, of real Elon and felt like, imposing my own identity my real you know my real world identity onto it wouldn't help that story so that was that was the driver of it and and at this point not much incentive honestly to reveal who i am i think it's just fun to keep the the mystery going it is because if you like go to a conference or something you're going to one of these big events you're able to walk around and nobody has any clue who you are I, I've done it. It's it's hilarious. It's like that uh, that meme of the guy standing in the corner and he's kind of thinking to himself, like nobody else knows, blah blah blah. Um, unless, unless you know, you do these podcasts, somebody recognizes your voice. It is not uncommon for us to be somewhere talking and they turn around and go Joel or Travis because they recognize our voices, and you'd be like, oh no. You, no, I, I don't. It's know that it's guy. true. I mean, your your voice in particular, I think, is is very specific, and I think I would notice it in a conference hall. But um, you're right, and I think that soon enough we'll have technology kind of like Shazam for voices. So I think I've got a couple of years uh, in me before I get found out. But to be honest, I don't do a lot of conferences. I think that uh, especially over the last two and a half, three years, um, I found that you know networking through digital means is is a lot more impactful. Uh, conferences are fun. It's good to reconnect with people in person, and I can still do that very carefully with those I trust. But uh, I don't need to be, you know, in a ten thousand person hall uh, or on stage or anything like that to get the job done. 
What would be really funny is, I mean, I'm sure you have family members that don't even understand what you do, let alone that you do this. And like, if one of them were to listen yep. to the show, they'd be like, that's Jimmy. That's, <laughs> that's Jimmy. I'm not Jimmy anywhere. <laughs> yeah, no, no, for sure. I, uh, people in the family follow what I do. And I think at this point it's, it's, uh, they get it. It was a weird conversation at first to explain it all, but um, I always take it back to video games and and sort of early internet days. You know, people didn't use their real names uh, in those situations. They were they were cool dude sixty nine. So it's a little bit of an evolution of that. Instead of just a name or a username, you also have kind of this identity of visualization, all these other things. So it's becoming less weird, uh, or at least in my circles, it is. I was trying to remain anonymous. I don't know why you just put my my old handle on blast. Cool guy sixty nine. <laughs> um, actually, it was cool guy four twenty. It was about that four twenty sixty nine. There you go. <laughs> so, so you're launching a project. So you were bored before other people were bored. So I wonder if the bored apes took a took a page out of your book. Uh, it's uh, <clears throat> hard to say. We've not gone down that, but you're you're working on some some interesting NFT things. So you want to tell us about what the board box is all about? Sure. Yeah. So outside of the uh, the board Elon identity uh, in the real world, I, I worked in the video game industry for for over ten years and um, spent a lot of time studying that 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 space and sort of watching where technology has taken it. Um, and so NFTs and, and blockchain in general are really starting to influence gaming. Um, and I'll use a really simple analogy. So back in the day, you know, you would go to a a store, buy a game cartridge or a CD, you played that game, and you were able to sell that game when you were done with it to a friend or to GameStop or whatever it might be. You own that that file, that property. And then everything kind of evolved to be digital. Like you would download the game, you could buy stuff in that game. And basically, as long as you're using that game, you you had you know access to that stuff, that digital stuff, but you don't really own it anymore. You can't sell it, you can't trade it, you can't do other stuff with it. And so what blockchain is enabling is people to actually own in-game assets. And so I think that's going to fundamentally change how video games work in the next few years. And what Boardbox is doing is basically curating the best blockchain games on the market. So I'm taking the professional experience of understanding what makes for a good game and applying that to the emerging blockchain games that are coming out. And so in essence, it's kind of like Loot Crate. It's it's games uh, game assets from a bunch of different games that I think are awesome put them in a box that is digital. People open it up, they get surprised, and they get to try new games that they may not have heard of before. I like that. Um, being in the game industry uh, as a, uh, a journalist first and then as a creator myself, um, I have you know been of the belief that NFTs and NFTs in gaming play to earn are the gateway drug for the masses, right? Uh, because look how big games are, how many hundreds of millions play Roblox and Minecraft, right? Uh, and that's, you know, in, in Fortnite, uh, if there is an easy way to bring people on and for them to understand, oh, I actually own this thing and now I can use it and be the, the dude who has it or I can sell it, that's, that is a huge paradigm shift for anybody that's used to buying skins in games. Yeah, it's exactly that. And I think you're spot on about gaming, onboarding people into technology. If you rewind, say, 20 or 30 years, um, being able to play video games with your friends was the reason people learned how to use a modem or how to set up a server or, you know, build their own their own PC rig. So the end point was having fun and playing a game. And you kind of went through all the obstacles of learning a new technology to get that done. And so we're kind of going through that again with with blockchain. It's it's a little tricky, right, to learn how to use a, a web wallet, how to buy crypto, um, how to secure it. But people will, will jump over those hurdles because they they want to do fun stuff. And that could be playing a game. It could be connecting with people. It could be putting a cartoon monkey in their Twitter bio. Lots of reasons to do it. But um, we're, we're seeing that that population of, of interested, you know, consumers growing and growing. So that's great. So you're going to be dropping in these boxes yep. uh, exclusive items from a variety of different games. That way, if they get these, they can just get it and go and they can start playing the game and actually and not have to be starting from ground zero. That's pretty Yeah, huge. that's that's the idea. I mean, it's just to give people more time to play, honestly. Um, and you guys probably feel this. Um, the, the game of Web3 uh, takes a lot of time, right? Like s- scouting for new projects, uh, buying and trading, being in discords, being on social media. That's a lot of time. And 
personally, as somebody who really loves video games, I feel FOMO now when I'm doing other things, including playing games or reading a book, and I'm wondering what's going on on the internet. So the whole idea here is people are going to be trading their their money for time. Like we're going to spend the time to curate awesome games so they can go and play them and have time to do that. Um, and yeah, it's it's very much a, a variety pack. So the idea is you'll get five items in each box. You might not love every genre or every game, but the hope is you'll keep a few of them and the rest uh, OpenSea is a great uh, return policy for it. Yeah. <laughs> What's awesome is it becomes like a marketing tool for these upcoming games. It's like they want to get their items in your board in your board box because they want people to know about their game, right? It's like a yeah. built-in audience. That, that's exactly right. I mean, our partners definitely um, are looking for exposure. We're trying to put the spotlight on them. And I think the big difference between us and other content creators that are uh, talking about blockchain games is we're really not going to focus on the economics. You know, we don't care about floor prices or um, financialization of the games. Like we're really going to be focused on gameplay, uh, on characters, on lore. Um, what you're used to seeing with games journalism um, that's that's what's going to attract the hundreds of millions of people around the world who are playing video games. Not necessarily the you know you're going to get rich if you buy this this NFT. Like that's that's not what we're trying to focus on. I haven't played Asteroids in forever, and I just I, on your website I found <laughs> an Asteroids knockoff where you're uh, and, and I died. You're doing pretty good, yeah. If you if you get over ten thousand, I'll be very proud of you. It's I haven't played in so long. It's like let me remember how to how to do this so you guys can actually go to boardbox.io and play uh, board Elon's version of asteroids where letters are flying through space instead of uh, asteroids and uh, and you won't get hemorrhoids if you play it. Pro tip: that, uh, hold down the space bar; it'll just keep firing. Oh, uh, there we go. Oh, yeah. So that now that's my road to ten thousand right there. <laughs> that's it. We're going to get there. I mean, I remember when asteroids came out. You know, I was there in the arcade. Um, I walked up to you both ways in snow to get there to play race. It's, it's not untrue, actually, because I grew up in Chicago suburbs and it was cold. And oh, my gosh, I died. OK, so <laughs> what what else are you observing now in the the NFT and gaming world that you uh, are? You know, you tweet a lot here about a lot of things, but what's really got your attention and, and what do you think people are missing? I think everybody's just looking for for utility for NFTs because we've we've kind of gone past the point of them just being these luxury objects and, and status symbols. Um, that will that will of course continue, but we're we're looking at the next stage of what actually can I do with these tokens? Like the promise is that these tokens um, declare ownership. They they make sure that people know that what you have is legitimate, that you own it, and they know where it came from. And so so now what? So gaming is obviously like a very clear utility for what you would use a token for. But there are so many other verticals that, that this is going to apply to, whether it's um, event attendance, uh, club membership, uh, identity, right? Like, how do you know I'm the, the real board Elon or, or a fake one that's been banned by Twitter? Um, so I, that's what I'm looking at is like so many different use cases for, for the utility. Um, and I think that's what's going to justify some of the prices that you're seeing in the market for NFTs. Um, a lot of it is is hype and status, but, you know, and again, back to sort of like the masses joining in this space, they're going to need to see real value before they plunk down cash and go through the the hurdles of, of learning how to, you know, buy crypto and, and have a wallet. Mm. So does the real Elon Musk follow you? No, he doesn't. He shouted me out a couple times on Twitter, which was nice. I think he's been a good sport about it. Um, but no, he doesn't follow many people. So no, no offense is taken. Someday if I get to meet him, that would be super cool. But, uh, you know, based on his content, it seems like uh, he's he's into the the meme life and uh, would be supportive of the, of the parody. I would I would imagine so. Well, you got a lot of followers uh, and uh, apparently, unlike me, you're not shadow banned. You have engagement on your tweets. Um, it has gone down a lot, I will say, though. I mean, honestly, like your your point about Elon, you know, taking over Twitter, I think would be beneficial because I think the algorithm has suppressed older accounts. Uh, mm-hmm. I definitely had used to have much higher engagement than I do today. It's still well, good. Let's, but, yeah. let's talk about that. What do you think his strategy is now? What chess game is he playing? Because, you know, the Twitter share, uh, the board, which has hardly any shares of Twitter in the big scheme, said, no, we're not selling, um, not looking out for the shareholders at all. So what's his next move? I, I think that uh, he's probably going to bring in other people to help uh, sweeten the deal. Um, 
my my conspiracy theory is that he's actually going to get Jack on his side, Jack Dorsey, and other people who see Twitter's future as a decentralized network that basically will be powering all intergalactic uh, communication between planets and satellites. And they want to see that happen. And it makes sense for Twitter to be the the social network that sort of serves that purpose. So um, I think that they're going to try to come back to the board and give them an offer that would be ludicrous to, to turn down. Um, and that's going to require a lot of capital, but clearly he's able to pull capital together very efficiently. If you look at his track record. Yeah, the Twitter Tesla. That's a you know, it's a great that's a great idea. Interplanetary <clears throat> galactic communications. That's that's kind of a wild that's kind of a wild trip to think about it. I've been reading that uh, he's he's leaves a lot of clues about doing a tender offer directly to the shareholders. So that's that's something that uh, or he's he, or he's uh, using Tender the app to find <laughs> new weird chicks. I don't know what, exactly what he's doing. <laughs> <laughs> so we shall see because I mean seriously, Joel Joel hit it on the head. The current board total holds seventy seven shares of Twitter. Like grandpa grandpa probably holds more fucking shares than that, right? How it's does like, a, how does a board change? Can the, can shareholders go? You know what? We want to replace this board. How does that work? Yeah, really? I think I think so. I mean, I, I I think that the board basically has to vote, and that's what allows you know members to be added or or, or taken taken out. Um, you know, in theory, if enough people bought shares of Twitter, uh, and Elon were to compel all those people to to you know make a certain decision at a at a at the next you know shareholders meeting, um, the board could be adjusted. So there's a lot of routes here that could be taken. But I, I agree with your sentiment that it's a little odd that um, the board members uh, on the on the Twitter board are not really active users or owners. It's fine that they don't own shares, like that could be a conflict thing, but to not be actively using the platform seems odd to me. Um, Another thing that's odd is that Vanguard and BlackRock own so much of Twitter, right? And so, Mm -hmm. and then the Saudi, you know, the Saudi prince owns so much. And so it's like, it's okay for for those, you know, organizations to own Twitter. And it's okay for Bill Gates to buy all the farmland. And it's okay for, you know, uh, you know, Zuckerberg to be a billionaire and and Bezos to own Washington Post. But God forbid, Elon Musk, uh, by Twitter, it's just like the the, the amount of raving rees and freaking out by people was just unbelievable this past couple of weeks. Yeah, I mean the current the current state of ownership um, is not necessarily a lot more desirable. So um, one, I, I definitely can understand the criticism that maybe there are alternatives that are better uh, than say Elon, but um, I don't think he's deserving of that much. Uh, hate, uh, you know, as opposed to yeah, a, a large ownership stake by you know Saudis. Um, that's that's not necessarily better for for us as users of Twitter. Board talk with board Elon, who is not made of boards. Good sir, thank you for coming on with us today and sharing your pseudonymousness with us. Awesome, yeah, great to be here. Thanks, guys, for the for the time. And you guys go follow him at Board Elon on the Twitters. There's some yeah. funny. Board some Elon, advice. follow us. The Nifty Show. Board Elon Musk. That's Doing it. it now. Board Elon Musk. <laughs> and, uh, some snarkiness and some insights into the industry. Uh, Travis, I'm not bored. Are you? I'm not. That's a cool guy right there. I love yeah. what he's doing. The background in, in games and and taking that and 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 sort of you know giving Elon a little a little jokes along the way. But you know what? It seems to me that Elon. Is probably one of our one of our real superheroes that we have on Earth, right? See, he's the closest thing that, that humanity has to a superhero. Some people will disagree with that vehemently because they think he's an asshole because they've been brainwashed. But I think he's a pretty good guy. It seems like, unless there's yeah. some nefarious stuff underneath it all that we don't see. And there's always stuff we don't see, and nobody's perfect. But I think his intentions are good, and he seems like a down to earth dude. So no, uh, he's not down to earth. He's up in space. Bro. He's up in space. <laughs> Nicely done. All righty. Hey, thanks for watching and or listening to the Nifty Show. We would appreciate your reviews, especially if they are of the five star nature. Subscribe, hit the bell, tell your friends, tell your dogs. Dogs really like us. It's because we emit a pitch that is pleasing to their little puppy ears. And we will catch you on the next episode. Keep it nifty. Looking into the future, what do we see? It's lined with digital collectibles, we call them NFTs. Games, trading cards, digital art, and those crypto kitties. 
Joel and Zach are the hosts you'll know. Joel and Zach say this will blow. They're locked and loaded, so ready, set, go. It's the Nifty, really kind of spiffy, the Nifty Show.